Hi, everybody. This is the 50th anniversary of Title IX. Title IX is the name for the federal civil rights law that prohibits sex-based discrimination in any school or any other education program that receives funding from the federal government. Joining me to discuss Title IX is one of the very best female athletes this country's ever had, and a dear friend of ours, Annie Myers Drysdale. Annie, how are you? Great, Ross. It's always good to see you and talk with you. Annie, you're in so many halls of fame that I, I, I quit. I had two hands, and then I ran out of room. <laughs> the last time I counted, I think it was eleven or 12. That's, that's amazing. Well, it's up to about 18. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. Folks, in case you don't remember, Annie was a, uh, was the first, uh, four-time collegiate All-America basketball player. And, uh, one of those years she led UCLA to the national championship. You were on another national championship team at UCLA. What was that track? Yes, it was. My freshman year, I was on the track team, and we won the national championship. What event? I was a high jumper and pentathlete. They did not have the heptathlete yet, and uh, so I was a pentathlon and a um, high jumper, and that was really my first dream to go to the Olympics was in track and field, and uh, my path took a, a different turn, and, and it happened for basketball, so it was in the 1976 Olympics, which was the very first year they had women's basketball in the Olympics. Yeah. So it was a five event for you with the correct. Pandemic. What were the events? Yeah. Gosh, Ross, it's so long ago. Um, long jump, high jump, uh, the hurdles, the quarter mile, and uh, I think it was a shot. No sprints, huh? <laughs> well, the, the hurdles, 100 hurdles. Yeah, that's right. You told me this one time, but I forget the answer. How many sports? Have you played? Well, in high school, I was in seven sports and played three at UCLA. So I played volleyball, ran track, and and played basketball, but also played a little badminton, a little tennis, and and did some rugby. The athletic director said, "No more rugby." <laughs> Don't take a chance on getting hurt, huh? Right. Yeah. You were seventeen years old when Title IX became law in nineteen seventy-two. Were you ever able to use it to help you in your career? Certainly none of us knew what Title IX was. And uh, Patsy Mink was the first uh, woman of color in the Senate back then and uh, from Hawaii. And she put this bill together. Uh, Senator Birch Bayh is the one that really got it pushed through. And with that, none of us knew what it was. And there were so many things that happened, not only the that bill passing, uh, it was not intended for women in sports and girls in sports. It was intended to be an education bill mm. to help equal pay for educators, which we know even today, 50 years later, is not true, uh, not just in education, but in corporate America. But uh, certainly it was something that was a beginning that became the calling card for girls and women in sports. And because of that, now there are scholarships uh, but I will say that the majority of schools within this country, Ross, not only starting at the junior high, the high school, and going into the colleges, are not in compliance of Title IX. Mm. And uh, there are still a lot of fights. There's a lot of women out there that are trying to get just the weight room, the same equal, not equal rights to use the weight room, but to have the same amount of weights that they use, uh, the same equipment. You know, men get uh, compression pants now. I don't know if they wear jock straps anymore. I don't know if the boys do. It's more compression pants. So it's part of the uniform. Well, women don't get bras. They don't get sports bras. Mm. And uh, so a lot of times in, in a, a softball field or a baseball field, baseball field is all trim and mowed and uh, the paths are clean and so forth. Well, the girls, lots of times in junior high and high school, they've got to go to a park and uh, clean up the park and uh, if the bases are muddy and stuff. They've got to dry it out or soccer fields are terrible uh, for girls and so forth. So even on the college level that a lot of, a lot of women do not have the same equal situation that the men do. And a lot of, 
a lot of people perceive that Title IX has created a lot of lost sports for men at the university level, which is not true because what's happened really, if you sit and look at it, before Title IX, what made money for the universities? Majority of the universities, major division one programs, football, football. and probably men's basketball, football. maybe a splattering of women's basketball, but those were the sports that made money. So baseball didn't make money, track and field doesn't make money, tennis and golf doesn't make money, swimming and water polo don't make money. Let's go down the list with men's sports. They don't make money. So who supports them? The football and basketball programs. Yeah. So that is spread out amongst the men's programs. Well, now, now they're saying, well, now you have to distribute it to the women too. Well, the men don't like that because now, it, now you've got to be equal with the women. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a matter of fact, some of the universities, for example, in basketball, they will take uh, a lot of the men that will practice against the women. They're called practice players. And some mm -hmm. they're used as managers and so forth. And the universities will count that as a scholarship against the women. Mm. And those are just little things that the athletic departments kind of pick up on and so forth. But um, Title IX has been great, but it also has a long ways to go. Title IX was a 37 word rule put into law. That's all, 37. Well, well, actually ESPN, and if people want to know, ESPN has done a three-part series of 37 words. They can look it up and they should watch all three series of the 37 words history of Title IX. I'm going to move away from Title IX for just a little bit here. I want to get you to talk about the Summer Olympic Games in 1976 in Montreal. You were selected to be on that team, but you have told me the United States almost did not have a team represented in that sport. Tell that story. Well, it's true. I mean, they did not, the only six teams could go at that time. It was the very first year they had women's basketball in the Olympics. And at the world championships, the Soviet Union, Japan, and, um, and Czechoslovakia, they qualified at the world championships. Canada was the host country, so they automatically, they automatically qualified. And so with that, only two teams, two spots were left. And so we had to go to a pre-Olympics. And because of that, we hadn't qualified at the world championships. And 1976 also was the first year that they were making a change on the men's side, Ross. As you well know, um, Hank Iba had been the coach mm -hmm. in 72 and in 68. And I think he might've been 64, maybe not. But I know he was in 68 and 72 and 72. The Soviets had, what, two, three times to win gold and take that medal away from these college kids because you had to be amateurs at the time, too. Mm. And so Doug Collins was on that team and Mike Bannum and uh, gosh, I can't, you know, my mind is blank right now. But um, we had a pretty good team and we won gold. Uh, Doug Collins had two free throws at the end, but they took them away or they gave more time. And so right. they made a change on the men's side and Dean Smith became the coach. So that was a big story because he brought four North Carolina players on that team, which had never been done before. It was always a college player from each you know, school around the country. So that was big for 1976. So we didn't even in the women's side, not only did where we were not supposed to go because we hadn't qualified, we didn't get any attention because it was all on the men because of Dean Smith in 1976 and uh, uh, Adrian Dantley and uh, Walter Davis and Phil, uh, um, uh, who was uh, the point guard for North Carolina, can't think of it. Uh, Scott May was on that team, Tom Ligardi, Mitch Kupchak. Um, so, you know, that was big news for the 76 team. Plus it was right next to the United States and Canada. Well, you, talk about, you talk about the athletic part of it, but what I was really referring to was the fact that you said you had no subsidy from the federal government. You had no money coming in to send you and you literally went out and did your own fundraising, didn't you? We had to raise money to, uh, you know, go to the tryouts. We had to get ourselves there to the tryouts. They had four regional tryouts and probably 300 women at each tryout. And so the coaches around the country had to kind of whittle it down. It was USA, ABA USA was the name of the, it wasn't USA basketball, it was ABA, American Basketball Association, United States of America. 
And Bill Wall was running things, and uh, he has since passed away. But uh, Billy Moore, in 1975, we went to the Pan Am Games, and Kathy Rush from Immaculata had been the head coach. Billy Moore was Cal State Fullerton coach, and uh, Billy Moore eventually would become the Olympic coach. She had coached my sister, Patty, at uh, Cal State Fullerton to a national championship. But so my sophomore year at UCLA, my freshman year, I'm on the, on the Pan Am team. We go uh, try out for the Olympic team. I make the Olympic team. It's very competitive. And, uh, but now we've got to qualify. And so we go to, uh, actually we go to, um, over to uh, Canada and uh, we have to qualify in a small tournament there and Cuba is there, Bulgaria is there, France and Italy and Australia and all these other countries. And uh, because there was no money for us, the, we, Bill Wall had given Billy Moore $500 off his credit card. And we stayed at Rochester University, which is where Kodak was based. And Kodak had become a major sponsor, was the first major sponsor in women's collegiate sports, which was women's basketball. And Hunter Lowe was instrumental in keeping that relationship and connection. So we got to stay at the university for free. And uh, we, had, as players, we knew nothing. We were all 20, 21 years old. We were all college kids. And uh, we had no idea how things worked politically. And, wow. uh, but we go to Hamilton, Ontario to qualify. And we ended up winning that tournament. And Bulgaria came in second. And that's how we went straight to Montreal from Hamilton, and we were one of the six teams then that qualified for the Olympics. Did you win the silver medal? We won the silver medal, and it was a round robin. The Soviet Union was a team that had been together for probably 10 years, yeah. and their front line averaged 6'6". Their guards were in their 30s at the time. And uh, so, you know, back then we thought, oh, women can't play after they're 21 years old. And, uh, but a lot of these women, they had Uliana Semenova, their 7-2 center, who was as big as Shaq. And huh. uh, so they were a very dominating uh, team that had been together, and they were very difficult to beat. But we, and we were the very first game to play. Lucia Harris, who has since passed away, was our starting center from Delta State. And they just made a documentary on her, uh, the queen of basketball. Huh. And so it's surprising that people did not know about her. And I'm so happy that this documentary came out on her. And actually, the Ben Proudfoot, who did the documentary, also did a documentary on Patsy Mink about Title IX. Yeah. Um, but certainly, you know, Lucy was the first one to score a basket in the Olympics uh, in 1976. And uh, I think I might have passed her the ball. But, <laughs> so, uh, but um, we played Japan. We lost that game and we lost to the Soviet Union. But we beat Canada, we beat Bulgaria, and we beat Czechoslovakia to win the silver medal. All right. Wow. Back to Title IX. You were the first woman to sign a contract with the National Basketball Association team, the Indiana Pacers, seven years after Title IX was approved. I'm going to assume that Title IX was no factor in that. Is that right? No factor. Well, you know, so much leads up to it, Ross. My sister, Patty, who's the oldest of 11, she's eight years older than I was. And she was playing basketball and volleyball and softball. And I saw women playing. So when I hear even young kids today, here it is, 2022, and young women, whether it's softball or soccer or what, you know, they say, well, we didn't have any women role models. And I did. I was watching women. I read a book in fourth grade on Babe Diedrichs and Zaharias. Yeah. It was in the 1932 Olympics. So don't tell me there weren't women out there. Althea Gibson, Wilma Rudolph, Wyoming Atias. I mean, we had the Olympians and uh, certainly Patty Berg and all, the, the 13 women that started the LPGA and Babe Diedrichson was part of that. Mm. But in saying that, those, those women, they're the ones that opened the doors for all of us. And I saw that. But Title IX, I was just in the right place at the right time. My brother David was at UCLA playing for Coach John Wooden. Yeah. Kenny Washington, who won two national championships with UCLA and, and Coach Wooden, that he would be the women's coach. He would come home one weekend with David and say, would you like to go to UCLA on a scholarship? And I'm going, yeah, of course. <laughs> so with my brother David at UCLA, it was a human interest story. 
Yeah. They won the championship in 1975, his senior year. I'm a freshman. I go to the Pan Am Games. I go to the Olympics in 76. I'm on the world championship team in 77. In 78, we win the national championship at UCLA. So all these things happen. Billie Jean King in 1974 plays Bobby Riggs. Yeah. The Women's Sports Foundation starts in 1974, 75. So all these things are happening with people not even understanding where it's going and what, what it's all about. And so in 1979, um, I had hoped to go to the 1980 Olympics. I was the number one draft pick in the WBL, which is the very first league in this country. So when they say that the WNBA is 26 years old, that's true. That's the WNBA. But women's professional basketball has been around for 44 years, yeah. starting with the WBL. And uh, being the number one pick, I couldn't go because I wanted to stay amateur for the 1980 Olympics. Yeah. So I was amateur, but then all of a sudden I get this offer to try out for the Indiana Pacers. And it was an opportunity of a lifetime. So it was a very difficult decision. Uh, Jimmy Carter made the decision, President Jimmy Carter made the decision not to compete in the Olympics after I made my decision. Mm. And um, so, you know, it was an opportunity of a lifetime that most men don't get. And I thought, why not? And I think you told me you got into a couple of uh, practices with the Pacers and maybe a scrimmage or two, but never got into an exhibition game. Well, it was a free agent rookie camp, completely different today. You know, what are there, three or two rounds now in the NBA? And back then there were 19 rounds. Wow. <laughs> and uh, so, but I was a free agent and uh, the free agent rookie camp is a lot different than it is today. So I went back and Slick Leonard was the coach. Jack McClossey was an assistant and um, Slick came out to California several times to try and talk me out of it, which I was not going to have that happen because in, High school, five years before that, that happened to me where people talked me out of trying out for the boys' high school team. But that opened the door for me to make the USA team. And uh, I just always believe one door closes, another door opens. You know, there's, there's always something else to go forward to. And uh, so with the tryout with the Pacers, the WBL was upset at me. Uh, they said, we, the games passed her by. I was 24 years old. They said, she's too old. She's the game. You know, she doesn't know the game. We've got better players in our league. And not knowing anything about public relations and marketing, that was a way for them to get publicity. And yeah. uh, certainly I left the Pacers. It was a three-day tryout. We had two practices a day. And so after the three-day tryout and going through six practices, uh, Slick Leonard called me in and said, you know, you did great. You're better than half the guys out there fundamentally. And uh, But we're going to move on. And, and the thing is, too, Ross, I signed a personal service contract. So yeah. I was going to be with the Pacers, whether I made it as a player or not. I had expected to be a player. Um, so it was very disheartening for me. But in saying that, it opened the door for broadcasting. Yeah, sure. I had taken the broadcasting classes at UCLA. And as you well know, you and I worked in men's UCLA game uh, back in 79, which was my first broadcast. Wow. And uh, you were my play-by-play -play guy and, and made it so easy because uh -oh. I had no idea what to do. We were but, at Berkeley. Uh, we were at Berkeley, weren't we? We were at Berkeley, Cal Berkeley, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any, but I don't you know. It opened the door for me, and uh, who knew that 45 years later I'd still still be in this profession? And you look great. Do you, <laughs> do you have any specific examples of how you saw Title IX help a female athlete? Oh gosh, well. You know, what was it just a, a few years ago at the women's final four in basketball that uh, one of the Oregon kids, she took a video because that's what social media has done. Is she took a video and showed the weight room for the women at the final four. And I think it was, a, you know, just kind of a, a, an ace shaped thing and it had hand weights on it. That was it. That was the only thing. Oh. Then she was able to videotape uh, what the men had in this huge convention hall and it was ridiculous and uh that went viral it went viral and, and the ncaa had egg on their face and apologized here apologized there but you know women are in situations where majority of the athletic directors are men football yeah. coaches still dominate uh i know of a, a a woman coach that she is constantly uh in in uh contrast with uh the men coaches that they're trying to take things away and the, the football players have no respect for the women's programs. And, you know, mm. there's still this mental attitude about 
how women are treated and uh, especially on the athletic field. And, and Title IX is just not about sports. It's also about sexual harassment. Well, that's, and, what, and, I, I, that's what I want to talk to you about next. Title IX was initially drafted to ensure equal opportunities for women in sports. Today, Title IX applies to all forms of sexual harassment and assault, domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking. So there's still a, an attitude of, you know, I always use the term where you hear a father say, you throw like a girl. You let a girl beat you? And so when you hear those terms, they're in a negative sense. And when you- And that's, that a, that's, a, a, that's the title of your book. That's the title of my book. But when you, you hear some a male say you. that to another male, it's demeaning to them. So they're basically saying that being of the female gender is not positive. But if you think if you're married to your wife or your mother or your daughter or your granddaughter, that this is how you feel about your, your children or your spouse or your, your parents. And so, you know, the attitudes, yeah, they've changed, but they still have not to the extent that the young girls and young women still fear for their safety uh, in a lot of situations. Mm. David Weber, a professor of law at Creighton University, teaches Title IX in his sports law class. He says people often view Title IX as two separate laws, a law that helps women participate in sports and a law that helps protect women from harassment. Do you agree? To a certain extent, I think it's much more than that. As I said, originally it was a law to help for equal pay and to have teachers on an equal level. And we know that that's not true today. So as much as it is about, it's be, as I said, it's become the calling card for sports. It was never about sports, but women are smart enough to have used it and say, no, this is a federal funded situation. And you, so if, and you go back to the 1976 Yale women's rowing team where they didn't have any restroom for sh or showers for them. They would get up early and have to go on the bus with the men. The men would do their rowing. They had to, they had to use the men's old boats. And then when they were done, the men were still working out. There were no showers for them. They had to go back on the bus where it was freezing. They had to wait for the men. And, um, and then they had no showers to go back to at Yale. They didn't have anything there. But they were the ones that went in and they brought in the newspapers and, and uh, or one of the, um, I know they, they had Time Magazine or somebody was there with them and they wrote, you know, Title IX on their chest. They, did, they walked in on the Women's Associate Athletic Director because they had gone to her in the past saying, we need these things. This is what we need. And they didn't have those and, and nothing was done. So once they got exposed, not only did they expose themselves, but they exposed Yale that you know, oh, okay, we'll build a, a restroom and, a, and a showers for you. Hmm. But not until you make a drastic change or speak out where you're embarrassed, will something be done. But I will tell you that the football coaches, they're, they're not for title line at all. Hmm. But then you, but, but Ross, just to talk about, you know, then you get somebody like Pat Summit at Tennessee. Yeah. You, know, you get a woman coach that is highly respected and, and, what they do for their programs yeah. and before title IX, 75 percent of coaching jobs on the high school level and the college level were held by women but because there's more money now in the women's program less than 50 percent of those jobs are hired by women hmm. a nebraska attorney who has consulted on many title nine cases dave domina says title nine has made a difference and it is really a weak law. <laughs> Why is it a weak law? <laughs> I don't know. I, I wonder if he's married or has <laughs> daughters. Anything you want to add about it? Well, that, you know, again, that's coming from, from a man that feels that, uh, you know, that women should not have what men have. 
And we still live in a society, not just in this society, but over the world, all across the world. I don't care what society, whether you're in Iran or Russia or Japan, China, South America, Italy. I mean, men and uh, especially in South American uh, culture, um, you know, women are supposed to serve us. And uh, so you have a lot of that um, growing up. And so I think what sports has done for both girls and boys, it's brought out not only competitiveness, uh, the desire to compete and de desire to excel and be the best that you can be. But it has also shown that in corporate America, 80% of the leadership jobs held by women, they were athletes. Uh. And I know that I've talked to enough corporate people too, Ross, that when they're looking to hire women and add diversity to their company, they're looking for athletes. Yeah, sure. Because they know how to fail, they know how to succeed, they yeah. know how to compete, they know how to, to adjust to adversity. Uh, and yeah. uh, there's so many things that sports teaches us in life. So why wouldn't, the, like you just mentioned, this, this gentleman, why wouldn't he want somebody like that on board? Sure. We know that, sure. that sports writing, sports casting, uh, journalism is dominated by men. And uh, the radio shows are dominated by men, especially white men. And uh, so there is a certain thinking, and you look at the ages of a lot of these people, but you know, certainly when uh, athletes compete and they come out and they're trying to get, you know, they're, now they're only 30 something years old and they're looking for a job and they're staying in sports. And that's why you know, it's wonderful that we have so many outlets in sports uh, and um, the internet has created so many outlets for people to continue to be a part of sports. But in saying that, there's still this sense of girls aren't good enough. Yeah. Why should we pay the women what the men get paid? Mm -hmm. And uh, until we start finding people like, you know, Kobe Bryant and his daughter, Gia, he was ready to change the WNBA. Mm. And uh, you had Megan Rapino for soccer with her retiring. Who's going to be that voice? You had Billie Jean King for tennis. Who's the voice for, for tennis now, especially with Serena Williams retiring after mm. the U.S. Open? So mm. who's the voice? I mean, women have to be stronger to be out there, to be to take the hits from people, especially on social media. Andy, is there anything the sports public, the fans can do to help this situation? Well, I tell you, you know, the WNBA has been great. Uh, certainly the Women's Soccer League, uh, tennis, golf, you'd love to see more exposure on those things. But you know what, the, the athletes themselves, the coaches and so forth, the, there's so many opportunities to, continue to be in sports, not just being an athlete. But, you know, there's some strong voices. And uh, I love the fact that they, they're not intimidated and they're continuing to fight for things that are right. And uh, so I, I'm just proud to be a part of this, that history and so many of these other young women that are coming up and making history themselves. Well, what a wonderful role model you have been. And thank you so much for giving the time to us today to talk about this because you're so knowledgeable about the subject and uh, you know how much we love you and glad to see you again. Oh, Ross, anytime. I love talking with you. You are so, so full of knowledge and I'm always learning when I'm listening to you. Annie Myers-Drysdale, our guest, and I know you've enjoyed it.